Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is June 12th, 2017. Um, and as always, I'm very excited to be bringing you another episode of Mormon Stories. Uh, today's episode is broadcasted live on Facebook Live. Um, and we are going to be continuing our series on losing the Lamanites. So for those of you who have been following, we've interviewed two, quote, Lamanites so far. The first was Vanya Moore, who was raised in Brazil. Um, and then the second episode was Hiram Joe, who was Navajo, uh, is Navajo, and uh, was primarily, I believe, in, in New Mexico, if my memory is um, serving me correctly. And we've received a lot of good feedback about those episodes. And a lot of people have been very interested. A lot of people have connected um, with what we've been trying to do. And we've had a few more people volunteer to, to be interviewed to tell their story. Um, and so today we're going to be interviewing uh, Sarah Newcomb. Before we bring Sarah on, though, uh, we just want to thank everyone who's joining us live on Facebook Live. Uh, we really appreciate when people are able to make comments uh, or ask questions. That makes the Facebook Live part really interesting. So we've got Cody Layton um, ready to moderate comments and questions. And please start them coming if you've got anything you want to share. Uh, please do. Uh, really quickly, we want to make sure everyone understands that this podcast is brought to you by the Open Stories Foundation. Um, the, uh, those of you who are donate, donators, uh, you, you make this possible. So we want to thank everyone who, who makes this possible through their monthly donations. For those of you who, who don't yet support the Open Stories Foundation through donation, we want to ask you to consider doing so. MormonStories.org, you can click on the donate button. 10 or 15 or $20 a month can really make a difference between us surviving and us not being able to bring you this programming. Also, just very briefly want to mention that we have several upcoming events uh, that we want to make sure everyone knows about. Uh, we're coming to Dallas, Texas um, in July. Uh, I believe it's the 7th and 8th, but we want to make sure um, if any of you want to come to a workshop or retreat that's been specially designed for people either experiencing a Mormon transition or who have left the church and are rebuilding a life after a transition. Uh, July 7th and 8th will be in Dallas, Texas. August 11th through 12th will be with Dr. Julie DeAzevedo Hanks in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah County for a mixed faith marriage retreat. If any of you are in a mixed faith marriage and want to try and make the marriage stronger, uh, this retreat will do that. So please consider joining us. Um, September 14th and 15th will be in Seattle, Washington. October 20th through 22nd will be in Sydney, Australia. Uh, November 9th through 10th will be in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, and of course, we've got the Mormon Stories Cruise to the Bahamas based on listener demand in October of 2018. If you're interested in any of those events, just go to mormonstories.org slash events and register. We would love to have you. Okay, so that's enough. Uh, that's enough in terms of uh, news <clears throat> and uh, business. Excuse me, I'm uh, having a, a frog in my throat. Um, without any further ado, again, it's June 12th, and we're really excited to welcome uh, Sarah Newcomb onto the podcast. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. So t how did you hear about uh, this series, Losing the Lamanites? Um, I actually have kind of followed Mormon stories for the past year. Okay. Um, before that, I was unaware that Mormon stories existed. But when I first came out of the church was really when a lot of the painful parts of leaving the church started and realizing what had happened to me um, really started affecting me. So I spent a lot of time searching for... Um, ex Lamanites, I guess. Uh -huh. um, people that had been identified as Lamanites that had gone through a faith transition and what their experience was, and there just wasn't a lot out there. Um, so anytime something comes up, I'm immediately like listening to it, pulling it up, reading it. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I, I was really touched by the abstract of your story that you shared, and I told Cody, we need to get Sarah on right now. So 
thanks for coming on. Let's jump right into it. Talk to us about your, your, you know, what brought you to the church and, and, well, uh, I was, yeah, I was, uh, born and raised in the church. My mom's a convert. Uh, she's native American from a Northwest coastal tribe. And Tell us my the name dad, of the tribe. Tell us the name of the tribe. Simsian. Okay. It's Simsian. part of the first nations, um, group out of British Columbia. Okay. And my dad is a sixth generation Mormon. So I, yeah, I was born and raised in the covenant. My okay. mom had met him at BYU and classic Mormon romance and story. And was yeah. your mom, was your mom raised on a reservation? Was she raised in a suburb? Like what was your mom's kind of background they have, before? They have a, um, a community that Alaska is a little different. Hers is in Alaska and there's not many reservations um, left there, but theirs is a Native American community that, that has survived and it, yeah, it's a small island just outside of Ketchikan called Metlakatla, Alaska. So did, was she so. raised speaking English? Was she raised speaking yes, a native yes. language? Um, she was raised speaking English because when the natives first started hearing um, missionary work back in the 1800s and all of that, the language was kind of outlawed. Like they weren't allowed to speak it. It was a lot of them went into the Native American schools where they were taken out of their families and that that kind of affected the entire culture so right now they're trying to get the language back but um my grandmother knew the language still but that's okay. kind of where it stopped so was your mom raised sort of with a lot of western values and and or was there still as a lot far of as religion yeah there was a it was kind of a combination there's there's a lot of intermixing the religious values, Christian values with the Native American values. Okay. So. But she was raised sort of in a in a town that was mostly Simpson, is that right? Or Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you have a sense yeah. for what 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 drew her to the church? Did she ever told you? Oh yeah, the the family values, the I know the word of wisdom and um what the Book of Mormon's about, like all of it was very moving and intriguing to her and she's still a faithful member and yeah, she loves it. She's still you, very much in it. Do you have a sense that when she heard about the Book of Mormon and the way the narrative was told that your mom saw herself in the Book of Mormon and thought of the Book of Mormon That's, as her yeah. own heritage? Did, that is what they taught, yeah. And so, so she, she, she does believe that, yeah. That is uh, part of her. Okay, so she was she was she was a native Canadian, I guess. Is that what you would call it? Uh, uh, native American. I mean, the the main Simsian group is all in British Columbia, and it was a small group that broke off and headed south through Alaska. Okay. So she's yeah, Native American. She was born in America. And so when she heard about the Lamanites, and she's like, "Oh my gosh, this is my people. This is our ancestry," yeah, and she yeah. really connected to it. Okay. So you were born in the Covenant, and where were you kind of, where were you raised? Well, I was born in Utah, okay. and I've lived in 19 states now. Oh, wow, that's a <laughs> 15, lot. 15, 15 of those were with my parents. Yeah, my dad moved with his job. His job moved us a lot. Was it military and or something else? No, he was, he was in bank, he's in banking. Yeah, okay. he's retired now, but um, he just specialized, and so with his specialty, we moved quite a bit which was actually really, really interesting and cool because we've lived everywhere from Alaska to Virginia and New York and town. <laughs> Family's been all over the place, so. I'll, I'll just add a quick user comment. Josh says, I love the Simshian. I worked with many in Alaska. Sounds like Josh <laughs> maybe served his mission in Alaska. Um, but we've got at least one listener who kind of knows a bit uh, of your people. So, um, all right. So, Sarah, you jumped around all those different states. What was it like growing up in the church for you? As far as um, childhood was was great. As you know, we were moving so much. The church was kind of the same everywhere we went. You know, so everywhere I went, I'd have friends, and that part of it was good. Um, of course, I was always. I always look different than everybody at church, you know, like, uh -huh. <laughs> we were always just the darker complexion, the darker hair, but people were nice and kids were nice. 
the real changes happened once I, you know, turned 12 and entered young women's, but childhood was, was great. Okay. So you'd had the typical primary upbringing mm-hmm. and had friends oh, and, yeah. and you enjoyed church. So how did things change once you hit 12? Well, once you hit 12, of course, you start personal progress. You start reading the scriptures more. Um, and I, you know, typical kid, you know, anytime we had family home evening or anything, you know, I'm participating, but I'm also like off in my own head mm-hmm. doing my own thing and playing. And so once I was in Young Women's and had to focus more on what was being taught and really learn the stories, that's when I started really learning more about who the Lamanites were and what the Book of Mormon was about. So that I was, up until a few years ago, I was a full true blue believer. There was no doubt in my mind. I never questioned, actually. I never questioned. Um, And so I had a hard time reading the Book of Mormon, but I didn't doubt it. There was zero doubt in me, but I had a hard time just because the, the Lamanites were who I came from. And so them being evil and having the dark skin always just, it was just hard for me to read. So I never fully read the Book of Mormon until I was a young women's president. <laughs> like I'd bounce around in it, but I never read it from beginning to end. So you remember so, reading it as a young teenage girl and being disturbed by some of the messages? I struggled with with knowing that I came from people that had turned their back on God. Mm. I struggled with knowing that they were evil and dancing and all this stuff that was portrayed to be so bad. And yeah, I struggled with knowing that that's where I had come from. Um, I didn't know a lot of the things that I came to know about the Lamanite stuff, but I was, I was detached from it to a degree. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so all three young women's, I was pretty detached (laughs) and I would just kind of check out and, but I never doubted. I just was, yeah, full true. So did you attend seminary and you attend seminary and all that stuff? Randomly. Okay. (laughs) Growing up outside of Utah, you know, when you have to get up that early, it just, yeah, I'm the youngest of four. So by the time all my siblings were gone and it was just me, I, I didn't make it all the time, but but you feel like you had a pretty strong, you had a pretty strong testimony. Yeah. What was yeah, your testimony no kind of rooted in? The whole thing, like priesthood, priesthood blessings. Um, I would say that's probably where I focused the most because I'd received blessings from my dad, and I'd watch the priesthood and watch the passing of the sacrament. Um, I didn't doubt the Book of Mormon, so I'd say that that was a part of my my testimony. Um, Hearing my family members and friends at church, of course, you know, there's just, there was just no doubt. Hmm. So. Okay. Did you, um, what'd you do for college? Well, I, it took me a little bit. I, I took a break for a couple of years. I actually, I tend to be pretty determined about stuff and I graduated high school at the end of my sophomore year. Oh, wow. Um, That's early. Yeah. I started working full time. I, bought my own car. I (laughs) moved out, got an apartment um, when I was 18, started managing a store. And I want to say I was around 20 and my, my um, my patriarchal blessing said that I would go to Rick's college. (laughs) So I was like, well, I better apply. (laughs) That's pretty specific. Well, I actually had talked about wanting to go to Rick's college when I got the blessing. So it, Oh, okay. It's specific, but I, you know, I had expressed desire. Right. Um, so I, I was like, well, this is never going to ha- I'm supposed to be there. I need to go. So I um, applied, quit my job, and moved to Rexburg. And, yeah, I worked full-time the whole time I was there, paid for everything, got my degree. I got my degree in communications. Okay. And uh, studied some journalism stuff. And that's actually probably what started everything. It's right there because everything was about sourcing. This one journalism class I took, I was extremely interested in. Um, I'd originally majored in business, but switched to journalism and communication stuff. And, and everything I learned about sourcing um, kind of drove me for years, like just curiosity, wanting to know truth. I never applied it to the church. Um, 
once I graduated from college, I moved to Utah, met my husband and, um, what were you doing in Utah? Yeah. What were you doing in Utah? Well, I graduated from Rick's and I was kind of taking a bit of a break. Okay. Um, Nanette, Nanette's asking if you served a mission. Did you serve a mission? No, I okay. didn't serve a mission. I, yeah, I never had a desire. <laughs> uh -huh. I was, I was fine just hanging out, but, um, I will say Rick's college was what changed me. Um, in what, in not just, way? not just the journalism part. That is where I'd say I was first realized that I was unacceptable in some ways. Oh. Um, because living everywhere else, I'd, I'd never grown up around lots of members. You know, I went to school and there was two or three members I went to school with, you know, and everybody else was just regular everyday people. Um, so moving to, to Rexburg and and the whole dating scene and everything there I realized pretty quick that that there was something different and not that anybody was rude to me but well there were some things that were rude <laughs> so talk about that talk about that um, well for example um, some of our FHE brothers, Family Home Evening brothers, decided it would be a good idea to say who would get married first. And they put us in order, and I was, you know, at the end. Um, uh. And then there would be people that would, like I'd be dating someone, and they'd bring me home to meet the parents, and it would be over after that. Oh, no. um, I also had someone close to me that got engaged to a great family in Utah, and went to meet the parents, and when the to-be father-in-law found out that this person was Native American also, um, wouldn't let him in the house. So, mm. uh, you know, there was things that, I, that I'd see happen that I was like, what is this? <laughs> you know, I, I was completely detached and naive from that kind of stuff mm. um, until I went to Rick's and was faced with it on a regular enough basis that, that, I couldn't deny that it existed anymore. Um, they still got married and things are great actually. And, you know, I, th I think it was good for them, but it still affected me. You know, it affects me to see those kind of things. So, so. basically you were seeing racism in the church. Yeah. Like, to an extent. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, it's hard to, just that true blue Mormon part of me that's like, oh, forgiveness, forgiveness, oh, we just misunderstood. It's kind of automatic in me. Um, and I just see these good people and, and have a hard time saying that it was racism, but it was, mm -hmm. yeah. But even now, you don't want to, you don't want to say that. You don't want to call it that. Yeah, even now I'm hesitant, but it was. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> you know, I, I don't like labels very yeah, much sure and i think that no one's 100 percent anything yeah um so by labeling it race i i would hate to label a specific person racist you know because we people make dumb mistakes or misinterpretations and you know i don't and know I, and but, i'm guessing you feel like nobody means to be or wants to be and then maybe yeah. they're just doing what they're told well, or what they've been taught to believe right there's also the part that is very much part of Mormonism that I call plausible deniability, which yeah. is, you know, a legal term, but um, anytime that you try to say, hey, there's racism, there's all these reasons why there's not, then it, it just, you know, having grown up in that environment and I was so willing to always do what was right in how yeah. I looked at people, how I forgave um, yeah, I'd say there's, there's a lot of plausible deniability. <laughs> right. Yeah. You want to get, and you want to so, give people the benefit of the doubt and you, yeah. and you probably feel like everybody means well, nobody means to be that way. Nobody like, realizes the results of their actions. Sure. And you know, they're, they're reacting with their own information. And then I, I don't believe that the people that did the things they did realized what it was that they were actually doing. Right. So as you were raised in Mormonism, it does, doesn't sound like you ran around saying, oh my gosh, everyone's racist and everyone's mean. It sounds like you felt like people were nice and people did their best and you enjoyed being a Mormon. Is that true? 
Yeah, I'm kind of like that with everything. I, I just tended to be a happy, go lucky, carefree. And I was like that with people outside of Mormonism. Like, um, I do remember in young women's early on, like hearing things about like the great and abominable church, you mm -hmm. know, and how people would associate that with Catholics, I would get really upset and defensive. And when I'd hear things about any other religion, even if it was during a lesson or I should be respectful, that was the only time that I, yeah. So I was kind of like that with everything, you know, not just Mormons, but it, it's just kind of part of who I am. Sounds like you're saying you don't like it when people talk bad about other people or organizations and you want to. I don't like wanna... people making quick assumptions. Yeah. There's, uh, nobody's walked in the other person's shoes. Right, right. Okay, so yeah. how did things progress? You moved to Utah, you're dating, you're seeing some, some behaviors that don't feel good to you. How did it progress for you? Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't stay in Utah too long. I quickly, within, within a year after leaving Rick's, I was married. <laughs> so okay. I left Rick's, you know, the summer of 2000 and by, oh no, the summer of 1999. And then by 2000, I was married. Okay. So met my husband in November, engaged February, married in May. I mean, it was... It was Mormon. <laughs> Super Mormon. We would have moved to the date up even quicker, but family was all spread out. So we okay. had to be patient. <laughs> so you got super married super quick. Where were super you married? Quick. Where were you married? In the Logan Temple. Logan, Cache Valley. Logan. What brought you to Logan? I lived in Logan for a bit and loved the temple. And okay. I, I had a, you know, I've had family get married in the Salt Lake Temple and I loved it and it was beautiful, but it was so busy. Yeah. And I wanted pretty pictures and quiet. <laughs> so Logan, it was. Yeah, okay. So I made everybody drive, you know, from Salt Lake out to Logan. <laughs> you were a diva. You were a diva <laughs> bride. I was. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so how did, so when did things start getting rough for you or what, what happened? Well, or? you know, it, it didn't really start getting rough right away. Um, once I was married, you know, there's that shock of going through the temple. And like the Book of Mormon, which I hadn't read at this point yet either, fully from front to back. Mm -hmm. um, after my experience going through the temple, I had no desire to go again. What, like, what was hard? It about, was really hard. What are you comfortable sharing about what was hard about the temple for you? Um, the division that happens between women and God, like we're suddenly separated from him. It just wasn't what I thought it would be. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's basically what I struggled with. And after that point, um, is that hard to talk about? Yeah, it started. Was that, is that bringing bit. up? A it's a little hard to talk about. Okay. Um, I do remember in what, how old was I? I was a freshman in high school. So it was young women's and I'm in this class and me and my friend are sitting there and there's a bunch of guys in the Sunday school class and they're all joking about polygamy and having more than one wife and, Teacher walks in and he's getting stuff ready and he doesn't say anything. And I just remember that affecting me really bad. And I, I went home that Sunday and talked to my dad about it. And I was just totally against it. You know, it's like, what is this? You know, I knew I was aware of Brigham Young, but like most Mormons knew nothing about, you know, and the, any of the other stuff. Um, and that's when I was told, you know, well, I was getting pretty upset. I remember getting mad. It's hard because it was so long ago, but um, I don't know what I said, but I know my parents were getting frustrated with me. And that's when I learned that God was a polygamist too, and that this is part of our church. And so from that point, and then going through the temple, um, once I was married, that just always, it just got harder and harder to deal with that. Um, we got so the married. Temple, the temple reinforced your separation from God. Yeah. Your feelings I, that you were separated from God. It was like everywhere I turned, I was being told I wasn't worth as much. I was a Lamanite, which was of worth, but there was, of course, the sign and the curse and all that. Um, and then there was the polygamy, and yeah, and then being separated from God in the temple, you know, having the husband in between me and God. Um, hmm. and then we didn't have kids for five years. So I'd say it was pretty laid back. Like there was no, 
you know, from 2000 to 2005, we had our typical, you know, marriage ups and downs, which no one wants to hear about those. <laughs> um, but it was good. You know, we traveled a lot. We just had fun. And then in December, Christmas Day, actually, of 2005, I had my first baby, and it's a girl. So having your child, child, you know, just kind of makes it harder to deal with even more. You know, here I am raising my daughter, and I'm like, how am I going to protect her from the pain I've already experienced? And um, then when I, yeah, in 2000. Five, I had my girl then in 2007 another boy 2009 I had another baby girl and that's when I finally like something kind of snapped in me where I was like I can't deal with this part of of religion and I was still at this time zero doubt like full true blue Mormon believer um, let me ask you a quick question one of our listeners asked if you how your husband's family were with him, assuming he's Anglo, you know. Yes. How, was, how was his family with him marrying you? Were there any they, issues? Did you sense any issues? No, but they were converts. Okay. <laughs> so his whole family's converts, and um, a lot of the issues are kind of things that you're unaware of. So, like, young men grow up in the church learning that they need to marry within their own race, um, that it's encouraged. Mm -hmm. You know, but as a convert, you don't, you know, his parents just weren't aware of some of those basic things. Um, and my husband, I actually asked him stuff, too, because I was curious. And I'm like, well, who taught you these things? Did you learn these things? And he was like, oh, yeah. When we first met, um, he said he was willing to overlook the the encouragement of marrying within the race because he was just like, yeah, I'm just in love. and And... He said that before he met me, that he would look at interracial couples and he wouldn't judge them or think that they were less, but he's like, oh, they're going to make it harder on themselves and on their kids because that's the view of the church, um, is to discourage those interracial marriages. And, and that's where his mind would go was, oh, it's just going to be a harder path for them. Not that it was a sin, just a harder path. Um, and once he was dating me and once we were married, he was like, it just totally changed everything. He was like, it was nothing. You know, it's... It was no change. And he looked at interracial couples differently after that, just as like another couple. So but, it sounds like he and his family didn't have the deep, the deep seated sort of Mormon, Brigham Young based ideas. Mormon mm -hmm. racism. Okay. No. Cool. Okay. So I, I didn't mean to interrupt. So you had, oh, that's right. you had three kids. Is that right? Yes. And so at this point I'm at three kids. We've had a fourth since, but we were at three kids Two of them are girls, and even my son, I'm just like, oh, I don't want this part of the religion. But it's, you know, I'm full in, so what am I going to do with that? Well, you How don't am want I going to teach part? them? You don't want which the part? The polygamy. So, sorry, we're going back to the polygamy, no, which okay. was my first struggle. So, the polygamy is just this, and it, and it has to do with the fact that women are lesser than men in, in, in God's eyes. Is that Yeah, kind and of really, really the experience I had when I was in high school, in, you know, the church Sunday school, that, that really is probably what affected me and sent me down this road but you know every you know every year once maybe twice you'd hear a close friend would confide in me oh they struggle with this part of our religion you know so I would hear hear things but it's like nobody wanted to talk about it so as a faithful member I started praying for peace and I just would beg you know like in my prayers I'm like I don't need to understand it I don't need to know why I just want peace can you just bless me with peace? And I literally prayed from 2009 to 2014, <laughs> like <laughs> on a monthly basis, you know, praying for this, just peace. Um, in 2014, by then my research had increased, which I'll backtrack on that for you in a minute. But um, so five and years so you were praying for five peace. years, praying for peace. And because, so in 2000, yeah. and because it was all true, you know, I just thought, God's going to bless me with peace. I don't need to understand it. You know, this is a righteous desire and righteous desires are granted, right? So um, I finally, during one prayer, asked if, if maybe it was a mistake. And I get this just rush of warmth and feel like, oh, it was a mistake, which completely changed, you know, sent me down another path at this point. Um, now, whether that was 
Now, just to say, you know, so everybody knows where I stand. I'm not religious right now at all. So looking at that prayer, I can, you know, attribute it to, well, maybe, maybe it was God or maybe polygamy is not right for me. And I finally just found inner peace in a way. Um, but at the time you it, felt it's, I felt, yeah, I felt 100% that that was an answer from God. So, um, my fourth child, a year before this happened, um, was born in 2013. And during that year is when I started actually doing research. Um, I had gone back to school, so I'm, I'm actually finally like a few months away from graduating with my bachelor's degree. It's been a long haul. But I go back to school, and I'm not at a church school, which was actually good for me. So I'm learning research in different ways. And I start researching the history of polygamy um, and leading up to this, this prayer that I had in 2014. So from 2013, 2014, I'm just researching and I'm finding out all kinds of facts that honestly disturbed me. Um, I'd say that the worst one, <laughs> for me at least, as a true believing member, was that Emma was like, what, like 14th on the list of people sealed to Joseph, that she wasn't even the first person sealed. And I just kept thinking, if he w received this revelation of eternal marriage, wouldn't he rush to the spouse who had given everything to him and lost children? And um, I remember being really upset about that, that she wasn't the first one sealed. So, you know, I'm still, still true blue believer. So when I get that answer in 2014, that, you know, whether it was myself or God or, you know, just that rush of peace that polygamy wasn't, was a mistake. Um, I'm like, huh, well, what else is a mistake? You know, where, what else happened? Was it, and in my mind, it wasn't Joseph Smith. You know, I'm still like, Joseph Smith was a true prophet and Book of Mormon's true. So like everything there is safe. And so I pull out Doctrine and Covenants, and I'm researching Doctrine and Covenants to see what's changed from before Joseph Smith died to after Joseph Smith died. And couldn't believe all the changes. So I had notes everywhere. By the time I was done with like three years of research, I had like this huge binder <laughs> just full of, full of stuff. But that was the very first thing outside of prayer that I'd really done. Um, was pulling apart the Doctrine and Covenants. And I refused to go to like any anti-Mormon literature. So I was, everything was LDS.org. The only thing that I would use that was not LDS.org was BYU. So I would go to BYU historical papers and immediately look at their sources. And I'd source everything because I wanted the real information. Um, part of that answer to prayer in 2014 actually got me really excited about religion. So when I started researching after that prayer, it was not to prove anything wrong. It was just excitement. I'm like, wow, I, for the first time, really felt something that I'd never really felt. And I was ready to experience it time and time again and build a relationship, you know, with my Heavenly Father. And so I, yeah, I started researching and getting into church history out of passion. Like this was not a path that I ever thought I would end up where I'm at now. It was just, I don't know anything. And I realized I didn't know anything. <laughs> um, in, what was the other experience? There's one I missed in 2010. I was young women's president in a small branch. Um, and that's when I read the Book of Mormon from very beginning to very end. So that was the first time that I'd, I'd realized how much I didn't know. <laughs> you know, it's kind of embarrassing. I'm like, I'm a true blue believer, but I didn't know my Book of Mormon. And then I didn't know my Doctrine and Covenants, you know. So here I am just diving into history, all excited. Um, what did you think of the Book of Mormon when you read it? I read it in a week and a half. Wow. So... Yeah, I was trying to be a good example to my girls because I'd never read it. And so I was doing personal progress with them. Um, and it was, it was an intense read. But when you read that fast, you don't have time to really think 
for a long time about what you're reading, just the stories and characters and wars, stories and characters and wars. Um, Let so me I, you, I, it was, at that time, it was a good experience in a way. What, um, you know, there's this whole talk in the Book of Mormon about uh, dark skin being a curse. And then there's all that stuff about the Lamanites blossoming like a rose and the whole white and delightsome thing. Talk a little bit about how you thought about your skin relative to the curse and righteousness when you were faithful? It was um, unconscious. I don't know how to describe it. So <laughs> it did affect me. Like it genuinely affected me. I was taught as a child growing up that Lamanite skins were cursed, that we would lighten as we embrace righteousness. Um, and like... Yeah, my mom was taught that from, you know, early in her, you know, within the first two years of her joining the church, she's learning all this. She joined in the 60s, so it was right during that time when all that stuff was starting to be taught. Um, she served a mission on the Navajo um, mission in Arizona, and, like, she was teaching those kind of things. She, she, that was part of our religion at the time, um, openly. And so I grew up being taught that. I was taught that, you know, like, I was discouraged from like the dancing and different aspects of our religion or sorry, not our religion, different aspects of my culture. So what's, like, what's wrong with dancing? You mentioned dancing twice. What was wrong with dancing? Well, if you read the book of Mormon, <laughs> when the Lamanites go let go of God, they are wild. And it talks about all these things they do. And then when you associate that with the, pictures and you know of Lamanites that have been drawn the animation all of that you know it's it's very much connected <laughs> and so culture was kind of discouraged like that's so like the the native dancing the native ritual native cultures yeah the rituals all that were discouraged um and 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 Hiram Joe talked about that about how mm -hmm. participating in the sweat lodges and other things was discouraged it's, yeah because okay. it's like they, they view it as turning away from God because that's what the Book of Mormon teaches. So got it, got it. how I reacted to that was very, very subtle. I, you know, it's, hang on. Not going to cry. I'm doing good. All right. Crying's so, okay. Crying is um, okay. As I had children and would take them to the parks on a regular basis and anywhere we went, um, I don't know when it started because it is kind of subtle, but I would, you know, after, after my experience at Ricks College and becoming aware of my skin and seeing what people went through, um, and then I was married so quick after that in the temple, um, I started wearing a lot of sunscreen. Um, if I went to a barbecue or any kind of, there it is again. <laughs> Sorry. I would stand in the shade. I got a picture of my grandma here. <laughs> Just gonna, hmm. When I drived, when I drived, when I would drive, I would like grip the steering wheel underneath so that my arms were in the shade. Um, I would also like sweep my hair forward to like cover anything because I was in the car a lot. Um, the clothes I'd wear, everything. I was trying to basically not get a tan and I tan very quick. <laughs> so even right now I'm I'm light compared to what I was when my husband married me. Because when my husband married me, I was still going swimming a bunch and standing in the sun and not looking for shade, not looking for constant sunscreen, not being so valued for that. I would say the hardest part wasn't how I valued myself. It 
it was that I brought a level of shame to my children, to my husband, which is ridiculous, you know. You felt like your dark skin brought dishonor to your husband and children. Um, he said that once he married me, he was treated differently by people, but it was subtle. Like it was something he couldn't describe. And when we'd go to church and I'd want my children to be just a part of everything, there, there was just this part of me that was like, man, why couldn't, you know, it wasn't so much that I wanted to be different, but I wanted somebody different for them. Um, yeah, so it definitely messed with me. Mm, so sorry. But um, thank you, thank you for sharing yeah. something so vulnerable. Because I, I've been trying to get at this with this series that I don't think we as white people have any idea what it's like to be given this false identity and a false identity that's so shaming. Yeah. When there's so much to be proud of, instead you're giving a false identity that's shaming. Yep. And yeah. that, that has its that has its consequences that I don't think we see. Well, I wasn't even really aware of how deep the consequences were until I left. Um, yeah, so 2014 I started the DNC research. Around 2015, my son turned eight, and that was the first time where I was like, I don't want him to get baptized. And I had no plans to leave the church. I was still considering myself a believer, yet I didn't want him to go on a mission. And at his baptism, I was just like, I don't want this for him. Um, my third isn't even eight yet, so like, don't have to go through that again. But he did get baptized. After he got baptized, so from 2015, he was baptized at the end of 2015. So from you know all of 2016, I really got into research. Um, yeah, right after he turned eight in November of 2015 to probably February of 2016, I have a list of like 40 things and it's all, <laughs> it's all from church sources. I didn't use anything. Um, in March of 2016, I found the CES letter and I was like, wow, that would have saved me a lot of time. <laughs> But I would have never, I would have never read it because it was anti-Mormon to me. Um, and I actually had, there was a link to you and that's how I found Mormon stories. Um, and for the first time I felt like I'm not crazy. You know, I felt like I was crazy up to that point, but finding Mormon stories definitely uh, made me feel not so alone. Um, yeah, my husband, we wanted to do a gentle exit out of the church. We didn't want to tell people why we were leaving. Um, I guess I should backtrack a little. I told my husband finally some of the stuff I was finding after my son was baptized. Up to this point, the only thing I'd ever complained to him about was polygamy because that was something everybody knew, you know, and I didn't want to affect him. But when I'd be struggling through the years, that would be something I'd bring up. Um, so he'd never heard any of the stuff that I was looking at until after my son was baptized. And for him, he just went through it and he was like, I'm done. Well, it done wasn't with what? the church. Oh, like wow. He, it was just super you know, fast. It was super yeah, fast. within a month, he was like, you know, I always questioned things, but he hadn't seen any of the stuff that I showed him before. Um, and for him, it was fast. Yeah. Well, lucky For me, you. I, lucky he, you. I was, yeah, I know we've been told because that's not always the case. It's not always both of you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've, we felt very lucky. So uh, he started staying home with the kids that were sick, like winter time, everybody was sick and I would take my oldest to church still. And we just decided we'd go until the end of the school year. That way, you know, the activities for the kids were all ending the Cub Scouts and the um, activity days stuff for the younger girls um and we never told we had friends ask us why we've had family ask us uh, well not a lot of family but some of the family ask us why 
and I'm just very general. Like I'm like, well, church history <laughs> and keep it mild because it's such a personal journey that, yeah, like one of the answers I'm, I just say, you know, it's church history. If you want to read it, it's there. If you don't, don't worry about it, you know, but for me, it's, it's not what we want. So, um, oh gosh, I just saw Christina's comment. That's going <laughs> to Christina, <affect> me. <laughs> Christina, my old friend, Tina, Prince McClendon, she wrote, your tears connect us all. We likely have different reasons, but the pain is similar and we grieve with you. So many hurts, so many, so much time and money lost, so much pain. I'm so sorry that the church made you feel that way. It is so wrong. I am happy that you were able to leave and start the healing. When, uh, Wynn writes really powerful podcasts, Sarah, thank you for your courage. Uh, he also writes the false doctrines, the fake beliefs really hurt you. Um, Leston writes, thank you for sharing something that was obviously so painful for you. Sunny writes, Kia Kahasis, with love from here in New Zealand. So he's speaking Maori to you. Oh, that's awesome. Joyce writes, I heard for you. Carol writes, what a sweetheart. I feel so bad. You're touching people's hearts, uh, Sarah. So thank you. Well, thanks for the comments, everyone. Um, anyway, so yeah, in, in May of 2016, um, you know, every people at church had been asking, well, where's Chris? And Chris had exited his calling. I was teaching Sunbeams at this point. Um, and he my husband's name is Chris. He exited his calling and said he had to support me because I had to be there for two hours and they needed me every week. And we had sick kids all the time at that point. Um, and so he just started staying home and the younger two, um, and of course the baby didn't care, but so the younger three all stayed home with daddy and they were, that's what they wanted. <laughs> so it was kind of easy with them. Um, my oldest had just turned 11 and, and so it was, it was a little harder for her. Um, and so in May, before we left, I kind of let her know and she, she asked why and I gave her just a few basic reasons. I didn't get into anything, just, well, the church believes in polygamy and, you know, I, I told her some of that. And I, what, about, uh, what about the argument that the church stopped polygamy? Did that not sit well with you? Uh, the church hasn't stopped polygamy. They've stopped practicing, but they haven't stopped believing in it. Right. It's still part of it. Um, and I also told her about the essays. Um, I shared one essay with her and I showed it to her. Uh, the one with the, how the Book of Mormon was translated. And my 11 year old started laughing her head off. <laughs> she was like, yeah, I'm done. And I thought it was gonna be really hard. I was trying to go gentle, just basic. I mean, it was like five minute conversation at the most. Mm. Um, and I said, mommy believes in honesty and I'm not going to be dishonest and keep things from you and this is why we're leaving and of course she doesn't know anything about what I went through as a Lamanite that's a little too much you know at this point but um, yeah so at the end of May I sent a text message or an email to the bishop saying they'd have to find somebody else for for sunbeams and we were out um, mm -hmm. finishing up going to church those last couple months was hard because it would like trigger trauma like listening to people talk about things in in sacrament meeting trying to teach these small children being expected to teach these lessons I felt like like I was brainwashing babies mm -hmm. um, it was really hard at the end but once I left um, telling my family was really hard but I tend to be a very upfront honest person and I I wanted to protect my parents especially because they're older and and so I went, I'd say a good four or five months, and I was like, this isn't an honest relationship. I would rather they rejected me than not know who I am, mm -hmm. than not know their daughter. You know, every time I talked to my mom, I felt like I was pretending to be somebody else, when really I'm the same person, you know, same values. But um, that, that was hard. All right, have all your older siblings remained in the church? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm the oh, only Oh, wow. Only so you're one. the first. You're well, I have one nephew. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. Who, yeah. Yeah. But your siblings are all still in. So you were the Everybody's first. Everybody's still in. Mm -hmm. Being the first to depart is always the hardest. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And so this last year, I think that's when it, 
it was like every time every time I thought I was healing there'd be something new that I was like oh my gosh I'm still struggling with this or that uh, there's there's this aspect of feeling feeling crazy like I felt like I was crazy for using my common sense using my brain seeing everything as just black and white and and valuing honesty like like that was one of the you know questions you know are you honest in all your dealings and I would do that with everything is this honest is this honest so like being raised that way and having lived that way it was really hard for me to not live honestly and so living honestly but being told by friends and family not aggressively you know but just what are you doing this you know what about the kids what's going to happen to your children <laughs> you know like there is this aspect that where i was i really felt crazy um and so i would have to like go through and research more and i i know i've heard other people have had to do this like where i would just listen to podcast after podcast after podcast and i would read at night for hours just to validate myself you know um, my husband, he didn't have any of these problems. He would just be snoring away, <laughs> you know, he was fine. Um, not that it wasn't hard for him, but, um, his mom had gone inactive a couple times during his childhood. So he had kind of gone in and out. Um, and it wasn't as much of a shock to his system, whereas I was totally true blue, you know, he, was, he wasn't pioneer heritage and he wasn't born in the covenant and well, raised. His, he, he was born in the covenant. His parents were members and sealed by then. Oh, okay. He was the youngest. So yeah. But it maybe it may, he I'm was, just theorizing. Maybe he didn't have the pioneer ancestry oh, yeah. and maybe that through your dad brought a extra level of intensity. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just speculating. My mom is actually more, outspoken and passionate about the gospel like it's beautiful in in many ways you know they both served missions then they met and got married they had four children they retired they go on a mission um it's it's brought a lot of joy to them but True. they come you know i i don't judge the older generations i have a hard time you know judging our elders just because they didn't have the information i you know i'm okay truth moment i'm 40 <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. i didn't have this information i went through college at ricks without any of this access to information it was just really starting to become easy um like in uh, i had all my years written down in 2015 when my son got baptized and then i started researching that was the first time i'd heard of the essays i didn't even know that they existed you know so how would i expect my parents to know any, you know, any stuff. I will say the essay, you know, Race and the Priesthood, the first time I read it, I was like, oh, so Lamanite skin's not a curse. And then I read it again, and again, and again, and I'm like, it has nothing to do with Lamanites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, it had to do with relieving, Afri yeah, the African Americans from the curse. But, so I was like, well, are we still cursed? And like, there was, there's so much information I found. I have notes everywhere of sources, but it is current in the, in the seminary manual. It's currently in the student manual for eternal marriage. Like it is a current belief that Lamanite skin is cursed. It's not, it's not, uh, oh, it just means spiritually. Like people like to put that, oh, the being cursed sign, the sign of the curse was just a spiritual sign. No, it literally says, um, hang on, let me grab one because I am not good at remembering. Here's the seminary manual, current seminary manual. Why was the mark of dark skin set upon the Lamanites? That the Lamanites might not be enticing. The Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. So they didn't want them to marry with the you know, with the Nephites. Um, in the 2013 manual, um, they use a quote by um, Joseph Fielding Smith that says, um, the dark skin of those who have come into the church is no longer considered to be a sign of the curse. But that's only for the dark skin people who have come into the church. 
like the sign still exists. Um, so me sourcing, I'm like, well, what context has this been taken out of? Because <laughs> that's just how my brain works. I, I got obsessed. So I went and I started reading the answers to gospel questions. Like I've read journal discourses. I've gone through, oh, so many books. But in Answers to Gospel Questions, Volume 3 by Joseph Fielding Smith, it says, in full context with what I just read you. Um, it continues from, uh, many of these converts are delightsome and have the spirit of the Lord. Perhaps there are some Lamanites today who are losing the dark pigment. pigment. Many of the members of the church among the Catawba Indians of the South could re readily pass as of the white race. Um, the Lord commanded the Nephites not to intermarry with them, for if they did, they would partake of the curse. And that's actually something that I heard from, from people, like that their children would be cursed. You know, it, it's passed on. Um, and at the very end of his, of uh, Joseph Fielding Smith's quote, it said, evil brought a return of the curse. So he talked about how when the Savior came, the Lamanite skins were all lightened, and the Lamanites and Nephites, everybody was the same. But then the Lamanites decided, people that decided to turn evil again, evil bought, brought return of dark skin. So like when I hear this um, apologetic stuff about, oh, they're not talking about the skin. They're talking about your spirit. You know, a darkness came over their spirit. No, they're talking about the skin. It's in the current seminary manuals. It's in the current student manual for marriage it's in it's all over the place um most the, importantly it, it the book of mormon is very clear that the skin is yeah. made dark yeah you can't that you might be you able to find one verse over here where it sounds like there's a difference between the the cursing and the mark or whatever but there are other mm -hmm. verses where it's unambiguous skin is turned dark because of wickedness yeah right? yeah yeah well, and I was also taught that, like, the Lamanites are constantly moving now. I'm like, <laughs> you know, with, with DNA and everything changing. And one of the other apologetics is that, like, I have only one quote from Fair Mormon, and it's location of the Nephites and Lamanites. And it says, the church has made it abundantly clear that it does not endorse any particular view of the Book of Mormon geography. Um, technically, it does. Because in an article by Bruce R. McConkie, um, quoting Joseph Fielding Smith, it's called Doctrines of Salvation. Article is called, Where is the Hill Cumorah? And it talks about, like, I don't want to read it. It's, it's pretty long. Um, but he says, Joseph Smith himself is on record, definitely declaring the present hill called Cumorah to be on the exact hill of the, of, in the Book of Mormon. Um, it is difficult for a reasonable person to believe that such men as Oliver Cowdery, Brigham Young, Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, David Whitmer, and others could speak frequently of the spot where the prophet Joseph Smith obtained the plates as the Hill Cumorah and not be corrected by the prophet if that were not a fact. So do, that to me is saying geography. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what apologists would say? That Joseph didn't even know. Yeah. And that, that to me is ironic. Like, like the book of uh, LDS.org, the DNA study stuff, how it says the Book of Mormon itself doesn't claim to know if the people were the predominant people. But it used to say that on the Book of Mormon page. My mom was taught that. People are still being taught. Like um, this year, Elder Anderson went and told young Native Americans, um, there's an article. The article's titled, Tells Young Native American Members They Are Part of the Book of Mormon. Um, if anybody wants to look up the article. Yeah. So he says, the Book of Mormon is true and you are part of it. The Book of Mormon is written for the descendants of the children of Lehi. And he's talking to singles from Kirtland, Gallup, and Crown Point, New Mexico. So people are still being taught that. Like, yeah. if we don't know... Where, where the Lamanites are, which, okay, great, take that route. We don't know. Claim the ignorance. Why are we teaching people that they're the Lamanites then? You know, it's, it's plausible deniability. They're taking every route possible and saying, oh, no, look, this is what it is. Oh, no, look over here. It's, and that's not the way it was in the beginning, you know, 
the way the church started out, it was black and white. Um, literally. Not, <laughs> not only that, but the Book of Mormon claims that its purpose is to convert. It, it's for the Lamanites to convert yeah. the true blood of Israel back to Christ. And so yeah. how ironic that the most important book ever brought to mankind, whose explicit purpose is to bring the original blood of Israel back to Christ. Now we don't know who that blood of Israel is anymore, especially given that DNA shows overwhelmingly that Native Americans come from Mongolia, not from Israel. Who are these pure blood of Israel that the Book of Mormon is written for? It's this incredibly shrinking Lamanite. And now, well, and I, I think some of why they avoid any of this, dealing with any of this, is because if they say that, oh, well, you know what, the Native American skin, it's not cursed either, then that destroys the Book of Mormon. Like, they can't say that, you know, they've done it for blacks in the priesthood, for the race. Um, they've said, okay, that, that was wrong. That wasn't a curse. They can't do that for the Lamanites because if they do, it takes away the power of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. It takes away the truthfulness of it. The most correct book on earth. Um, and there's no, there's no essay addressing this, as you mentioned. And, that's, and you're saying that's your theory as to why, because it, yeah. it strikes too close to the heart of authority and scripture within Mormonism. Yeah. Yeah, because if you read, I'm just going to read this. This is um, <clears throat> Second Nephi uh, 521. And he caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. So not only is it saying that they were made dark because of their wickedness, but it's saying that God sees blackness as bad and that he didn't want them to be attractive to the white people. So he made them black so they yeah. wouldn't be attractive. I mean, that's offensive in like 12 different ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I, I don't like saying too much about my parents because they are true believers and they're, they're good people. And I wouldn't want to hurt them in any way. And so even as a true believer, when I was full in, it, it was hard for me to see what they went through as an interracial couple because they got married in the sixties. Um, one of the, the manual from teachings of Spencer W. Kimball says, when I said you must teach people to overcome their prejudice and accept the Indians, I did not mean that to encourage you to intermarry. Like, um, and there was, there was a lot of problem, you know, he, he came from a very, my dad came from a very, you know, true blue, good Mormon family with a long history. And so that, I know it was hard for them to see him marry, but he, I'll give it to my dad. He is not, he's one of the most gentle, you know, accepting kind people. And I think that's why my mom was drawn to him and why they were drawn to each other. So, yeah. Sean's asking what your patriarchal blessing said about your lineage. Oh gosh, this is a story, Sean. <laughs> so being the youngest was hard in it when it came to lineage. Um, because every single one of my mom's children ended up Ephraim. And so I was her last hope to feel like a connection. Um, there was... Because your mom was what? Manasseh. And that's the typical thing, That's right? a typical Native American, Native yeah. Americans are given tribe of Manasseh. Yeah, yeah. And um, she'd if, given up... As if there's this blood lineage that literally flows through Lehi and, and Nephi and Laman yeah. and Lemuel all the way through to Native Americans, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and she'd given up a lot to to join the church. She 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 had an amazing conversion story and gave up everything. I mean, she gave up her entire previous life basically to join the church. Um and so as each one of her children are being, you know, told they're Ephraim, 
there was there was a degree of pain but she she was like oh maybe Sarah's going to be Manasseh I remember her saying this over and over and and so she was really excited for me to get my patriarchal blessing so I got it at age 12 <laughs> like huh. I think that's a little young because yeah, I remember being young. very that's... very playful I was yeah as much as I am into research and sourcing and and kind of obsessive about about research um at 12 I was obsessive about you know play and yeah. <laughs> imagination of course. I remember the most exciting part of me going to get my patriarchal blessing was this red fox running along the tree line out in the country you know if that tells you where my head was but you know I get my patriarchal blessing and I'm Ephraim and I remember just this distance beginning you know just I almost felt like it was a letdown or my fault, but I think in some ways, you know, I, my mom's family was taken from her in a way, and then her children were, you know, and it's not literal, you know, I, I know it's not literal, but mentally, I think it was hard for her. Um, it was hard for me to feel like a disappointment, but yeah. It's weird because if, if she had internalized that sort of, uh, you know, hatred for the dark skin or the cursings, I guess in one logical strain, she would want her children to now be, you know, Gentiles and be white, you know, and delight some. But I guess there's also that pull of just wanting people to be like you and wanting your kids yeah, to be she a part had, of you. She wanted, yeah, I think she wanted to share that. And I think that's natural of any mom to want to share with at least one of their children, um, their lineage. But I, I was often told growing up um, that I was white, that I wasn't Native American. Um, I'd still be brought home to Alaska to visit family and, and see my grandma and stuff, but I felt so disconnected because I was being told I was white, but I wasn't treated like I was white at church or school. Then I'd go home to Alaska and I felt like I, was an outsider um, because I didn't understand the culture completely. But my grandma, my grandma was amazing. Like <laughs> she was the center of the family. They still celebrate her life um, on her birthday every year, even though she's gone. Um, she was so loving and she was always accepting. There was this one time I was maybe 10 years old. My mom and I were um, there for, I want to say an extended period, like six months. Five months we went to stay and so she could see her family and I was going to school there for a little bit um, and my grandma we were in her bedroom and my grandma I'll try not to get emotional so my grandma tried to talk to me about Mormonism um, because it was hard for her when my mom joined um, because of the polygamy and the racism <laughs> specifically and so I remember my mom was in the room and my grandma was in the bedroom and and she tried to talk to me and me being just a proud Mormon, you know, like I was raised to be, I snapped at her. <laughs> so you'd think <laughs> that that would have changed our relationship, but she was, it, I never told her sorry. <laughs> And now, like, she's gone and I can't, but. So she was always the same. She was always telling family to love each other, to be forgiving, to accept each other. And, you know, she's not, she's not Mormon. And I'm seeing more acceptance and kindness and love from her than I had most people in my life, pretty much anybody she was the most loving and accepting always talking to the family in front of us pulling us together and kind of lecturing us but in such a loving way and everyone respected her um so for her to have tried to reach out to me and me react in anger i'm i'm not mad at myself because i was a little you know as a kid doing what i was supposed to um, but I'm upset that 
relationships with my Native American family were discouraged. Like, <laughs> I have this uncle, my Uncle Bert, who has called me every month for the last, well, since 2005, when I had my first baby, he, st he came to visit me. Um, and we made pies and we talked and he was, um, yeah, he's just been amazing. And so he wouldn't even know what I was going through with my whole spiritual journey. And he'd be calling me every month. And I'm like, it would be on my worst day. And suddenly he'd be calling. And I'm like, well, you know, you'd think that <laughs> with how little I gave to my family in Alaska that they have let me go, you know. Um, but that's not how they are. And uh, he, he and I still talk all the time. And it's just this connection where I'm finally starting to reclaim my heritage. Like I have a hard time saying that I'm Native American because I feel like I haven't been allowed to be and I'm unsure. But that's not the reality. You know, my emotions are one thing, but the reality, when I go just common sense, let go of my emotions, flip the switch, see, oh, that's nice. I can like flip the switch and my emotions are gone and go straight for common sense, research, study, you know, laid out, business-like, which is why I was gonna major in business. Um, and I can see it's ridiculous that, my grandmother was of the Eagle Clan. I'm an Eagle Clan. It passes through the matriarchal system. My daughters have that. My uncles never let go of me. Um, I reached out to one of my, my cousins and reconnected just this year. I, I sent a few text messages and stuff, but I'm super shy. <laughs> like, you know, like how do you express love for people that don't know who you are and can't trust you because they've been rejected by you, you know, in a way. Um, I have this one cousin that I... I love like we played tons growing up um, and he he got in an accident um, a lot of my a lot of my family are professional fishermen and they take the boats out on the water and he had gotten knocked off the boat and most people die like in the situations that he's in where they they get they're just gone um, they didn't know for miles and they turned around and came back and um, he'd been in the water hours and had hypothermia and they brought him to the hospital and I was in tears like <laughs> over the thought of anything happening to him and him not knowing how I felt and there's just this division because I haven't I put Mormonism first I mean when I say I was full true blue member I mean in every sense I didn't have time to go visit. I had callings. I didn't have time to write. I didn't have time to text. I didn't have time to serve anybody outside of like my Mormon realm. Um, and he, yeah, he has no idea how I feel. And there's, there's these bridges I'm trying to build now, but really I just need a chance to go back and visit. Um, and it's kind of, it's not just about them either. It's like reclaiming this identity that's been stolen. Um, reclaiming a pride about it. Letting, letting not just other people know what I stand for, but I guess it's more letting myself stand for those things and say, no, that wasn't right, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been an emotional journey because I was told I was white. And when I got that Ephraim, I was told that that's the white lineage. And, and so I always felt like I was being torn in pieces, you know. Um, and then we'd have like missionaries over for dinner and they'd, be, they'd look at me. And my husband, I'd be sitting there and they'd look at me and say, well, what are you? <laughs> Uh, and depend on where we lived, you know, in Texas, there's a big Hispanic population. So people, you know, automatically think I'm Hispanic. Um, but it's really dependent where we live. 
you know, people are just like, hey, what's your, and they don't mean it offensively, but mm -hmm. they don't ask my husband, you know, yeah. he could be Irish, English, Swedish, Norwegian. Technically, he's Scandinavian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get to details, but, yeah. you know, there's, there's this labeling that happens when, when you have brown skin where people want to be able to put you in a category. Um, and, it, and for me, it was never the category I felt naturally drawn to or felt like I belonged to. It was always, no, you're supposed to be over here. Um, I remember when I, the first Sunday that we weren't going to church, I walked out into the front yard and just stood in the sun. You know, I'm wearing a tank top, short shorts. And I was like, I'm not moving out of the sun. And sadly enough, it like, was hard for me. I kept wanting to like, nah, you know, it was so, so ingrained in me, which is embarrassing, you know, now, but to say that these teachings don't affect people is ignorant. Um, and it kind of goes back to the ignorance, you know, when we talked about racism in the beginning of our conversation, that it's just ignorance denial and you know the, the church is run by businessmen and lawyers and I think that's a lot why there's a lot of plausible deniability um, if there can be any doubt anywhere you know doubt your doubts mm -hmm. so I don't know um, so if you were to make a this has been so wonderful this is beautiful and powerful and touching if you were to try and summarize, let me just take a couple things specifically. So first of all, the teachings in the Book of Mormon uh, around skin and everything. If you were just to very plainly say why you think those teachings are harmful as teachings, and then we'll get to the separate thing about giving people an identity that may be false and that may be harmful. If you just had to speak plainly to why the teachings in the Book of Mormon are damaging, what would you say? How is anybody able to be proud of their brown skin when they are told that it is the sign of being cursed? It's not the curse itself. I know how they word it. You know, that's not the curse. But how is anybody to be proud of their skin or feel okay with it when the curse is the sign of the curse is only taken away depending on righteousness. Um, and of course they're getting rid of that now because obviously people don't lighten. <laughs> they don't change colors. They're, they're born a certain color and that's it. Um, yeah. Common sense, honesty. I, I'd like to push a lot of honesty in the church. Um, if there's anything I stand for, it's that. Like I had a hard time even telling my kids that Santa Claus was coming. You know, <laughs> yeah. I tried to argue with my, my first child that he wasn't real. And she was like, no, he is. I'm like, okay, we'll play Santa Claus. So we do Santa Claus now, but it was hard for me. And that's how can we say that this isn't a lie? You know, that this, this curse being dark skin is not a lie. How can we deny its, its effect? I mean, we, we know we know that in Joseph's time, people were trying to figure out where Native Americans came from, if the Bible were true, and they were trying to figure out why they had dark skin because they didn't have science. And so obviously, just like people tried to say that black people came from Cain being cursed, uh, it makes sense to take yeah. that folk teaching and then apply it to Native Americans. So, I mean, I think yeah. that's obviously where... Joseph got that idea. Um, well, you know, I dealt with a lot of anger and I had to figure out where my anger was coming from. I wasn't angry at my parents for teaching me these things. I, I wasn't angry at Joseph Smith or Brigham Young um, because everybody lives in their own reality in, the, in their time. Um, thankfully, we have, you know, we're in the age of information. It's different now. What I have a problem with and where my anger stems from slightly is um, I wrote, you know, I have this list of like 40 things that I found wrong, but then I wrote a new list of why I have major issues with the church. And it's, 
it's not pointing out all the things that are off and wrong. It's modern day cover up. You know, it, I don't expect Joseph to say sorry or make up for things that maybe he got wrong. But I do expect modern day, the church now, to not keep making those mistakes. I, I expect them to respect and love and stand for, am I being honest in all my dealings, which is a temple question. If they're not being honest in all their dealings, they're not living their own religion. And if, so that's, that's If somebody issue. says, well, that's what the essays are. The essays are the church coming clean and being honest. Then I go to, well, we've also got Elder Anderson, who just told a group of Native Americans that, you know, we can say, okay, well, let's, let's go that route. Well, DNA, we don't know who the Lamanites are. Then why are we telling a group of people, a, a group of single adults, that they are Lamanites if we don't know where they are? That, to me, is not being honest in all your dealings. It's just not. And then you're affecting them by saying, well, you are a Lamanite, and this is why you're dark-skinned. So you're not only taking their identity away, and this is where taking my identity away wasn't just affecting my skin. Like, that's, that's how I reacted. Not everybody reacts that way. Um, that was my experience. And I was, you know, I was Ephraim, and I was, I'm half white, you know. I'm, so there, there was a different experience I had there. But what really affected me was my culture that I didn't get to experience. I didn't get to, uh, if I would have felt free enough to connect with my grandma and m all my family there, my cousins, my, my husband, I've only taken him home one time and we've been married 17 years and I've been home to Alaska once. My uncle Bert reaches out to me constantly and I haven't made a trip, <laughs> you know? Well, now we, we added the fourth kid and of course, Having a family of six fly to Alaska, it's, it's pricey. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I finally feel like, the des you know, not just the desire, but I'm, if you would have talked to me literally a year ago, I was a mess. Like, I couldn't make sense of, of the damage that was done to me. Um, what I hear you saying is that the church separated you from your native ancestors. Yeah. Completely, 100%. And that that's a loss. Why is that a loss? How is that a loss? Because it's not honesty. It's, it's not my honest ancestry. It's not where I come from. It's not who I am. It's not any part of me. The, the, Lamanite, the Lamanite The Lamanite narrative. It, the Lamanite it, narrative. It, how, how can you tell every brown person in the continent that they're Lamanites and take away their real heritage and tell them their skin is cursed. And what do you lose uh, when you're disconnected from your actual real heritage and told that it's uh, an, an heritage with evil foundations? What do you, oh, so there's, there's two things being told that your ancestors are, are, have been wicked and being separated and cut off from them. What's the impact on you? Um, being told they're wicked when you think about my mom was the only one that joined. So her dark skin's not viewed as a curse. When she was on her mission, she had the other sister missionaries would put their arms against hers and they'd be like, oh, you're lighter than me, you know, her Caucasian Anglo companions. Um, so she, she had that experience. But then when you look at everybody back on the island, regardless of how good they are, you know, their, their skin still cursed. So how I viewed skin is just, it's just ridiculous to put so many aspects onto it. But as far as like the heritage itself, leaving skin out of it, um, which is a whole, whole different issue for me. Um, the heritage itself, history is powerful. Like how your people came from, we'll just take Europe, how the Irish I'm, I've, I'm like 40%, 48% Irish, mostly Irish on that side. How the Irish came across and what they did for themselves and how they started new lives. What if they were told, oh, no, that's not where you're from. And they had that taken away. It's not okay. Their ancestors fought for that. Um, any group of people that fight for something and fight to survive and 
have their own values that have nothing to do with one specific religion. I mean, there's over 4,000 religions. So <laughs> if you tell all of them that, no, that's not where you're from, truth is powerful. You identify with your heritage. You identify with where you've come from. Um, that's why it's so important. That's why so many people research it. That's why there's so much connection to, oh, I'm from this family. And even in the Mormon community, you know, if somebody's from the Joseph Smith line, what if we're like, oh, no, that's not who you're from. <laughs> you know, you're from this guy over here and he was inactive. <laughs> it's going to have an effect. That small detail of identity has an effect. And or from some guy who never existed, right? You're, or from some guy that didn't exist in this case. Yeah, but taking that heritage of, of where you're really from and twisting it, it's not okay. That's not being honest in your dealings. Do you find strength now getting back in touch with your ancestors and your real heritage? Does that provide you with identity or comfort or strength? Or um, In a way, yes. Um, I, I love history. And so through the years, I've read a lot about the Simsian history and of uh, the Northwest coastal tribes. Um, I like taking my kids to powwows and that type of stuff, even if it's not my tribe. Here in Texas, I'm not going to have the same environment, but I love going. But I, I always feel like an outsider slightly. So it's going to take a while for me to gain back what was taken from me, you know. Um, and again, I don't think it was taken on purpose. I don't, I don't blame the way I was raised. But going forward, there's no need for, for people to be taught this stuff. If we don't know where the Lamanites are, we need to st stop saying, hey, you're a Lamanite. We need to stop telling people who they are. So let's just say we wave a magic wand and all the church leaders stop telling brown-skinned people they're Lamanites. Does that solve the problem or is there more they would need to do? <sighs> Because people are still going to read the Book of Mormon, People right? are still going to read the Book of Mormon. People are going to be people. They're going to have their own experiences, their own interpretation. And I mean, brown-skinned people will still read the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Even if they're not told they're Lamanites, they'll still read it, right? I, I, it's really hard for me to answer that question because I do believe in being honest. <laughs> I, I think honesty has nothing to do with religion. It's very much a human, you know, it's about humanity. Yeah. Um, it is a natural desire in, in humankind to, to respect honesty. And if they were going to be honest in everything, that would take years. But as for this, I'd like to stop being dishonest. You know, like if you're going to say you don't know where they are, don't tell people that you know where they're from. Um, yeah, heritage is, is, is still a journey for me. Like, sure. And I'm still, still in this process of understanding how I've been hurt. You know, the skin thing has been the easiest for me to explain because it's simple. Um, explaining how I am upset having lost out on my heritage is a lot harder to explain. Um, yeah. Yeah, because you don't know cause you don't know what you've lost because you never had it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of a hard balance because I, I want to respect my parents. I want to respect my siblings who are in. I, so I don't tell them anything. <laughs> I don't, I've asked them questions before. Um, when, before I'd left the church, I was asking, you know, parents and siblings lots of questions like, was I the only one taught this? Like I, I was constantly doubting myself and thinking I was crazy. So I was like, I was taught not to join in in the dancing. Was that in my head? You know, am I remembering wrong? And, um, and one of my brothers was like, yeah, I was taught that too. So I was like, okay, confirming, confirming that I was taught these things. But yeah, the further I get out of, of the pain of everything and the further I progress in my healing, um, it's hard because I want to respect them, but they don't really know who I am now. You know, like I've changed so much and I, well, I say I've changed a lot, but really I'm being the person I've always been. 
Right. And I'm free to be that person now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So families, family is difficult because you want to just love and respect and honor them. But it is what it is. Some of why I wanted to reach out is I, I was so broken as I realized my identity issues. Um, and I would search the internet. I searched Reddit. I searched everywhere. I'm like, where are the Lamanite people that are struggling? And I ran across um, Angelo Baca. He's a film film student. He did this film in layman's terms, looking at Lamanite identity. Yes. That that really hit home for me. Like you talk about heritage being stolen, and I'm like, when I watch his videos, um, he did another one, but it. <laughs> there's something about pictures that put into words that I can't, you know? I think Thomas Murphy told me about that movie. We need to screen it here in Utah. Is that a powerful yeah, movie? Good. You recommend it? I highly recommend it. Okay. So how are you moving on now? How's life now for you? And Oh, the good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I <True>? like coffee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a lot. I can't drink much of it though. Um, my husband, I, I was so true blue Mormon that I was always pushing him to be perfect, perfect, perfect. But it was the church's perfection idea. And all the time, you know, poor guy, the entire time he was perfect as he was. Um, our relationship, like uh, when we first left, the first few months were like, I swear the sky is like bluer and the, like everything was heightened. Um, just joyful. The kids are relaxed. Our life is very peaceful. Like, you know, I, I've actually said that to my, my family and my siblings. I'm like, the last time I'm doing, I'm like, life is peaceful. It's like, nobody wants to hear that word, but that's the only way I can describe it. Sundays roll along and we're like, Hey, let's go for a hike and a picnic. <laughs> you know? um, it's just laid back. And now when I do service, it's, it's not this exhausting checklist to make sure I'm perfect enough to, you know, it's not somebody else's service that they're demanding. It's everything's going towards my kids. My husband's time is all going towards his family. Um, yeah, life's good. If somebody were to say, how are you going to teach morals to your kids without a church? What would you say? If you need a church to teach morals, then you've got problems already. Morality is natural to humanity. If, yeah, end of story. <laughs> How about loss of community? Has that been hard? Do you miss it? That was hard for me. I would say mostly because I'm a mom. Um, and I'm a stay-at-home mom because I, yeah, I tended to be like, I, I was very driven. You know, like I said, I graduated it as a sophomore. I got my own apartment, bought my car, put myself through school, never took out a loan. I was very driven. Um, it was hard for me becoming a stay-at-home mom, and now I'm a stay-at-home mom, and we have we moved to Texas. We're not from here, and so I'm a stay-at-home mom with no friends, <laughs> which I'm okay with, but it's hard for me to watch the kids because I'm like, all right, so I'm taking them swimming a lot this year, and we've signed them up for a bunch of, like, you know, city classes like, like archery and, you know, anything I can get them out doing just to help them have fun when school's out. Um, Are you near Dallas? I am. Oh, we got to get you some, I've got some good friends that I think uh, you would love. Yeah. Oh, in the Dallas area, like Jamie Hannah's <laughs> Handy and Jenny Dendy. You don't know any of those guys? Uh, um, I, they've been on, have they been on your podcast? I recognize the names. Yes, they have. Listen, Okay. I'm coming to Dallas Ju July 7th and 8th. I want to meet you and your husband, and I want to introduce you to some amazing people. Oh, awesome. Are you going to be Assigned in town? friends. Are you, are they won't gonna... have a choice, right? <laughs> no, they'll love you. Uh, some, are, some are listening right now. Are you, are you going to be in town July 7th? Um, yep. All right. Promise you'll, promise you'll connect with us. All right. I'll okay. put it on the calendar. Get my okay. husband to ask off. He loves having reasons to ask off from work. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I joined the meetup group. Um, there's a meetup in Rowlett, Texas that, that kind of was a lifesaver for me, but that's, you know, once a month I get to feel like I'm normal, <laughs> right. talk to people. Um, 
yeah, my husband actually stays home with the kids so that I can just go and just be alone and be myself and not worry about the kids at all. And so uh, I've got that as a social life, but that's, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Well, we'll, it was we'll, worth it. We'll do what we can. We'll do what we can with that. Well, okay. it's still worth it. And I'm lucky. My husband and I are out together, and that's not always how it goes. So so it's been good for your marriage. You feel like it's been good for your family. It's been good, good for your for mental marriage, health. Good for marriage, good for myself, good for the kids. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Well, Sarah, this has been really powerful. Um, just so moving. This is what I wanted to bring to the series. And Vanya and Hiram Joe started it off great, but but you really took it. You took it exactly to where I needed the series to go. So I can't thank you enough for being willing to tell your story. Well, I hope it helps other people in the same type of situation. That's why I wanted to do it because I searched for Lamanite stories and yeah. I was so excited when you said you were going to be doing them. Um, back when you did the DNA thing with uh, Thomas Murphy. Yeah. And then I, I kept waiting. I'm like, where are they? He hasn't done them yet. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody, Amy, Amy writes, I admire your integrity. Tim says, now you can claim who you are. Um, so many people are just loving what you're sh- what what you're saying and saying that you're beautiful. Is that insulting if people say you're beautiful or even if they say your skin is beautiful? Do you take that as a compliment? Do you take that as I take it as truth. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so are you no. comfortable in the sun now? I am. I have been, you know, when I've been taking my kids out swimming, I I pull my hair up in this big messy bun and just happily stand there. I I started running. I I had really high anxiety after I left the church. Like it skyrocketed. I had really high blood pressure about 3 months ago, like emergency room level. Mm. So I've been running 3 miles a day and uh I just yeah, I love being in the sun now. Like I'll just be running along loving it. Um, and it's different. Yeah, it's different. So I'm getting to, yeah, the healing point with my skin and just now starting to work on the heritage part of what I lost. I so. love it. Though those metaphors of being comfortable in your own skin and of standing in the sun and in the light. And I think those have a very real meaning to you now. Yeah. 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 My, my major that I I'm doing my bachelor's degree in is actually creative writing which I love to write. And it's interesting because I've never been able to write freely as a member. I was always like, Oh, well, what will I, how will I affect people? And is this perfect enough? You know, like I, it kind of kept me from writing the way I truly wanted to. Um, And the first piece that I, that I started working in in one of my classes is actually this experience of leaving the church. It's kind of an artistic piece. It never says the word Mormon or Book of Mormon or anything, but expressing that, that destruction. Um, I can't capture the pain that it was in, but yeah, a person just catches on, like there's this fire in this grove at the end and she burns, um, which is very much how it felt, like the sacred grove burned for me. But yeah, as the stories progressed, just it's kind of a metaphor for my life of, of running in the sun. Um, I've always loved to run, and now yeah, been running three miles a day, sometimes five, if the kids are with their daddy. So it's been good. Let's do a jog. Let's on um, Friday or Saturday morning in July. You let's want all, to? Let's all go on a jog. We'll have j- that I know would j- be awesome. I know Jamie Hannah's Handy's a runner. Um, and I'm sure there are others. So maybe maybe Saturday morning, July 8th, we'll all go on a jog early morning. That would be so fun. Let's I do hope it. she's excited that you volunteered. <laughs> she will be. She will be. <laughs> all right, Sarah Newcomb. Uh, this has been so delightful. I can't thank you enough for your honesty, your courage, your wisdom. And we're all inspired. And the listeners are all just, you have to go back and read the comments everybody's saying how inspiring you are and I'll just add my, I'll add to it. Uh, Thanks for this amazing story. Um, This is super important and uh, we just really love and appreciate your sharing it with us. 
That's awesome. I'll get, I'll probably need a box of tissues. I did good. I held it together. <laughs> hey, we love, we but love tears on Mormon means, stories. That means a good. lot. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll just close and thank everyone for tuning in. We had a really good group. We had over a hundred people at one point simultaneously listening. Facebook tells me right now that uh, over 50,000 people have been reached, that there's over 4.3 thousand views. So this really has already started making a dent and it's going to pick up as soon as we release it. Um, so thanks to everyone who joined us uh, live. We want to thank everyone who's listening. Uh, thanks for the comments and the questions. They always make it better. So thanks everyone for joining us on Mormon Stories Live. For everyone who's joining us uh, asynchronously, we want to thank everyone for tuning in for Mormon Stories. If you have questions or comments, if you want to share your own stories, feel free to go to mormonstories.org to this post and share your feedback, share your appreciation for Sarah. If you have any comments or questions, you can put it there. If you have something mean or derogatory to say, just don't bother posting because uh, we don't need that kind of stuff, but we appreciate anything positive or constructive. Uh, we want to thank again everyone who donates to the Open Stories Foundation. We don't do this for the money, but we need money to do this, if that makes sense. So everyone who donates allows Amy Grubbs to work for us, allows Cody to help with the production, allows me to do what I do. The other podcasters, Gina Colvin, Dan Witherspoon, Natasha Elver parker your donations go to keep all these podcasts alive, to support the mission of the foundation, and to let us uh, support more Mormons in transition, whether they stay in the church or leave it. But we want to thank everyone who donates and then just remind everybody who appreciates what we do, who doesn't support us financially, to please consider making a monthly donation at 10 or 20 bucks a month. Those donations can keep the foundation alive and allow us to do what we do. Uh, please check out mormonstories.org slash events for the events coming up, whether it's Dallas or Seattle or San Francisco or Sydney, Australia, or the Mixed Faith Retreat in August. We want people to attend and we want to help as many people as possible. So please consider supporting us. If you want to support the scholarship fund, there's actually a scholarship fund where you can help put people through a workshop or retreat. That money is tax deductible. And you just need to email mormonstories at gmail.com if you want to donate to the scholarship fund. We'll tell you how to do that. But thanks most of all just for everyone who supports us, who, who uh, encourages us. It makes, uh, makes possible what we do. Um, so thanks again for everyone who tuned in. And Sarah, most of all, thanks for sharing your beautiful story with us. You take care. And we'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks. Sounds good. All right, Sarah. Take care. You too.